Good evening, everyone. Um, we have a special guest to speak to us tonight. Uh, he's not on the agenda because it was a, a bit of a last minute thing. So we aren't going to start the meeting so we can follow our agenda. But may I introduce to you Captain Bowles. Uh, Captain, would you like to come up to the podium and he has a few words to talk to us about safety, security, and police matters. Let's get Captain. Bowles. I think everybody can hear you. Yeah. Um, I just want to introduce myself to y'all. My name's Captain Kevin Bowles with Corpus Christi Police Department. Front Loop District, which goes from Staples to the Island, that's my district. So the island's in my district. And a little bit of history about that. I've worked on the island or in Flower Bluff for the last 20 years, with the exception of maybe three or four years. Uh, when I when I first made captain, I was up in administration for a couple of years, and then I got promoted to XO, which is the executive officer over the Uniform Operations Division. And then when we changed out to chief deputy, I moved out here to Flower Bluff, which was great because I love Flower Bluff and I love the island. I'm in tune to a lot of things that y'all have issues with and y'all deal with. I dealt with them for years and years. So anytime you have any problems, give me a call. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to know what's going on. I think that's the best way that our police department can work with the community. You're kind of our eyes that really don't belong to us. You give us the information. It really helps us make things happen out here. Um, this is one of my lieutenants, Cody Harrison. He, he's also kind of new out here, but he has been here before also. One thing I'll tell you about um, the island is we're trying to make sure that officers are out here all the time. I know in years past, Sometimes you would have to wait because they got called into the town. So we've separated that area and, and I made a decision when these guys came on that no matter what happened, I want officers to stay on the island at all times. So we may send one out to back up another officer, but we still have two out here to handle anything that happens. It's just too big of an area not to have anybody out here. I know as we go from spring break into summer, it just gets busier and busier and busier out here. And I've seen that the accidents have increased out here tremendously over the last five years. So that's another thing we're working on in the Operations Bureau to try to get more crash cars to work out in this area. So if you need to get a hold of me, you can call the police department and ask them to get me in touch with you. I can't really say that I'm ever in my office. I try to be out in the field a lot, and if you call there, I might miss you. But if you call the police department, ask them to get a message to Captain Bowles, I will definitely respond to you within the next day or so. And do you guys have any questions for me? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, Dan Brown. So, uh, no, but uh, something happened out there in the community. So my wife uh, today mailed a check, or a couple of days ago mailed a check to her son. Put it in the mailbox, put the little red thing up, and of course it was stolen. Check was cashed in for $700. It was only a $70 check or something like that over in Kmart in Kingsville, or someplace in Kingsville. So just, you know, I guess the message is, first of all, never write a check. The second thing is don't put it in your don't put it in your mailbox with the little thing up that just tells, I guess, uh, it, it was somebody in a white truck, that older gentleman. All right, not gentleman, just an older fellow, obviously. <laughs> but uh, anyway, just a message for the community. And if you can help us with the, with the people you, using the mail and get, get the little red box, you know, a little red flag up. I guess that's a red flag to tell people to come look in your mailbox. Tell somebody, tells you somebody something's put in there, right? Wow. 
You know, it, it's funny because the criminal minds, they never stop. They're always thinking of new and better ways to steal and, and take things from people. And we have to stay on our toes to keep up with them because sometimes they start implementing things that we don't even know about until somebody tells us. And it's pretty amazing how, how that works. I'm sorry to hear that. We'll actually put that out in our briefings just so let them know to be on the lookout for those things. This has been going on for quite some time with the mailboxes. Right. Uh, what is the police department doing about that in particular? Meaning that I, this is a daily occurrence for people on the island. We we message each other and post things and. The mailbox issue isn't isn't a new issue. We work with the postal service. The postal service has jurisdiction of anything that gets put in the mail. A lot of times they work with our OCU and our detectives to try to develop leads and find out who those are. I don't know. I don't have any details to give you because I'm not aware of what cases they're actually working on. Do you know of any that have been brought up lately? Not here. So the, the easiest thing to do, you know, is to probably contact the postal inspector. They're supposed to they're supposed to have they're supposed to track every one of those cases. They don't have people on the island. There there isn't a presence, you know, with the federal government on the island. And sure. so we rely on the police department and we have packages stolen off of our front stoops that is USPS, Ex Federal Express, and that's not the Federal Post Office jurisdiction, you know. Right, that's, that's, that's a problem over the entire city. And I think over the entire country. I was looking the other day that um, I believe UPS and a few of those companies are actually coming up with new things every day to try to stop that from happening. But yes, um, we, we see those all the time, the ring doorbell camera that a lot of people use. We've caught several people on those that are just walking right up to the door like they live there, grabbing a package and leave. Yes. Just a quick thing, I think we all need to harden ourselves up a little bit though too. I have a, a locking mailbox on mine, which is pretty sturdy. I think it was less than $200 on Amazon. Uh, we just need to recognize that this is an occurrence that's going to happen over and over again. Right. We need to make it harder because the thieves are going to go to the easiest targets. Sure. If you have a lot the mailbox, you're less likely, not nothing's perfect, but you're less likely to get hit. I saw where Amazon has uh, actually got a program right now where they give your garage code and they can open it up when they get there and they put the package inside your garage and then shut it back. So, th so they're coming up with new things every day. The, the, the issue is that the police can't be everywhere on everybody's street all the time. We'll definitely file the case and we'll definitely go arrest the people if we know who they are. But you have to take an initiative to secure your own things as well as you can. Um, yes, sir. The yeah, new Aquarius light seems to be causing a lot of backups. I had to come to a halt at the very top of the bridge the other day where the backup started. Uh, I noticed there was an officer apparently running the light there, but uh, there's the traffic from Aquarius to the 361 intersection is generally very light. I wonder if it's possible to, to let the uh, traffic flow a little better past the Aquarius light there. You know, I looked at that the other day because it was backed up quite a ways to find out if it was because of that light there. And it was actually not. It was actually at the com uh, the Commodore's intersection where things were getting really backed up. So what we probably need to do when we're expecting heavy traffic is to have somebody at both those lights operate. Is there? Um do you think y'all are ever going to deal with um, making like Flower Bluff and the Island One unit instead of bringing in stables and losing those officers that have to go over to that area? So uh, repackaging or whatever. So originally, when I went to work out here, we we met at the substation over here off of Commodore the Fire uh -huh. Department, and we had six beats. The this two were out here. And the other ones went to the OSA, which 
which is right there, you know, where the Oso Bridge is. Sure. Um, after a few years, because the Charlie District, I guess, got bigger and bigger because we were going south, they expanded up to Rodfield. And then this last expansion about four years ago, four years ago, took us all the way to Staples. Um, we had we had enough officers at one time to cover the six beats. It seemed as we kept getting larger, though, we didn't get as much manpower as it kept expanding out. And we need to add additional manpower out here. I've asked for it. It's been asked for several times, and uh, I'm sure when it comes, when we get the officers and they come available, we'll get more people out here. So it doesn't really matter what the parameters are. There's enough officers. Yes. To do it. So it would matter if we got small. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And 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 that's the thing about it. the district's not too big. It's just we need to add more manpower right. to the, each of those shifts. Thank you. Thanks for coming out. We appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate you coming out of your time. Thank you, John. Thank you. All right, well, let's start our meeting. We will stand for the Pledge of the Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Well, to start the meeting, I think it would be good to uh, uh, call a roll here. Let's uh, Carter, are you here? I'm here. <laughs> John? Yes. Nick? Yes. Marvin's here. Martin. Dan. Kelly. <laughs> and we have Kelly by uh, electronic means tonight. Can you say hello, Kelly? Hi, all. Can everyone hear her? That's a requirement. Yes. Can you hear everyone? Absolutely, yes, I can. All right, let's proceed. Uh, any conflict of interest statements, please? None. None? All right. Uh, next up is. Uh, Polly, you want to come up and tell us about the ISAC? Sure. <clears throat> Does everyone know Polly Balzer? Everybody? Okay. She's our ISAC representative, by the way, in case it's not obvious. Hi, can you all hear me? Hello. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, uh, real quick update. The uh, meeting was held on May 7th, and um, we had uh, the usual number of um, city officials there to give us a report. Um, there was one uh, gal that uh, uh, came to make public comments. Um, she made a request for life rings at the beach after that. Uh, the recent incidents, um, she um, made a pretty strong argument for um, the city to put some life rings at the beach available to citizens in case of an emergency. And um, there was some discussion, there was no resolution about that issue, but there was some discussion by um, ISAC and the city about um, whether and where and how to make that happen. Um, the city um, gave uh, reports the planning department um, indicated it would be nine to 12 months before any project on the island is going to start. Water, shore, and beaches. Uh, there was a discussion regarding changing the city ordinance requiring kite borders to stay 50 feet from other people on the beach. And the discussion was um, that there would be an increase to that distance. <coughs> Uh, water control, harbor bond, the, the harbor bond um, is expected to be reimbursed in full by FEMA. Um, FEMA is a little bit mysterious, so we don't have uh, specifics on that, but conversations are ongoing apparently. Uh, parks and recreation, there's been some problems with the Riley Pete Dog Park. Um, not with the park 
per se, but with some of the communications between the city and the uh, folks in charge of putting that project together. Um, there was a discussion that, um, or I guess the Parks Department um, was planning to address it within days after the ISAC meeting, and um, hopefully they've gotten some resolution to that. Where uh, the Parks Department is also waiting for estimates regarding splash pads and uh, where they might be located on the island. Um, one ISAC member suggested maybe putting one at Riley P. Dog Park. The beach superintendent gave a report about adding lifeguard stands this year. There will be a total of eight lifeguard stands at the beach, which is three more than we've had in the past. Um, we just had some buoys installed near the boat launch and there was some discussion about using the jet skis more often during emergencies. Um, the beach superintendent discussed uh, budgeting for more lifeguards and um, indicated that lifeguards are currently practicing and training and they do intend to use the jet skis more often. Um, there was an update uh, from the engineering department. The, um, beach facility uh, that's been an ongoing project project is ready to build but they're still waiting for a decision regarding the site and there are issues of safe, safety aesthetics value that they are considering when making the decision regarding the site uh, the beach access at newport and zon um, that project is still under design uh, the park road 22 project Apparently there was some miscommunication between the developers and the city. It seemed the developers were waiting for the city and the city was waiting for the developers. But at that, at the ISAC meeting, they agreed, they discovered the problem and agreed that they would track down documents and work together to move forward. Um, the Packery Channel recap is, uh, the design is still under review and meetings with FEMA um, have taken place and so that's expected to move forward. The uh, Packery monitoring contract is um, under discussion. Um, how often that needs to happen is being looked at. Uh, the city is uh, hiring or has hired a third party consulting company to provide a recommendation uh, regarding how often that monitoring should take place. Uh, the Packery Channel Boat Launch Pavilion. Uh, apparently the low bid was over budget and the city is either A, uh, going to revise the design slightly um, and or award more funds for the project. And the Packery Channel Showers apparently is a hybrid project between the city and county. And so there's still oh, a week or so before it will come before the commissioner's court. At uh, the meeting next month is scheduled to be one week later than is usual. So it's gonna be on Monday, June the 10th instead of the first Tuesday. So if anybody wants to attend, it's an open and public meeting. It'll be at 5.30 at the um, Holly, uh, Holiday Inn Express. So, um, and typical, is that it's the first Tuesday, and again, that's public, uh, you know, is public, and anybody is welcome to attend. That's all I have. Thank you. Any questions? The, uh, the board has had the... Uh, Microphone. I'm sorry. <clears throat> hold, it, hold it down and turn it on. Turn me on. Can you hear this? Yeah. Okay. Um, there have been some board members that have had some discussion about the new IGA grocery store going in. Um, is there any any uh, information from the ISAC that uh, that they're looking into the delays or anything like that? I have not heard any discussion at ISAC about the IGA. Carter, did, they didn't talk about that at all, did they? Um, but she says that. Uh, they're waiting on uh, a, a permit. Uh, and, and she said it was two weeks away, a couple of days ago. But there are some issues with the wetlands on the back side, and there are some issues uh, uh, that 
the uh, developers are having to um, buy some other property. And so it, it's held up for a while. I mean, I, I'm sure you know, there's lots of different ways to explain it, but you know, everybody has their own story, but that's my understanding. Is wetlands a state or a federal? It's a state. So it's beyond the... They have to buy, uh, it's between two and three times what you're going to end up using. But it has to be in the same water table, which is basically from Port Aransas to the National Seashore. And so he's got to buy like four acres of that, I understand? And so that's going to be cheap. So is the so it sounds like the city issue isn't the primary problem that they're running into. Uh, well, I think it has been in the past, but I think it got in the past, and now they're on to you know the big stuff, the hard stuff. So if it, if there is a war in the next couple of weeks, I'll um, we'll get the next. Yeah, we can uh, we can bump it around just see what they do. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, we'll inquire from the the city. We'll do that. Thank you, Carter. Uh huh. Thanks. Marta. Um, yes, is there a um, project underway as far as the, the riptides to educate people about them? Because usually what happens with them is people don't know how to respond, they panic, they try to swim to shore, and they drown. Messages they, received from so heaven. If you Messages. relax <laughs> and then swim out of it parallel with the shore, Usually it's not all that difficult, um, and people care much better. And I'm, I'm just wondering if that might be a viable addition uh, to this concern. And I'll, I think like um, a gal that talked about life breaks might have talked a little bit about that, but we, there isn't, a, as far as I know, a yeah. city program for it. You know, obviously the, the uh, you know the parks department is is responsible for that. I think it's a good idea, Marga, we should bring it up yeah. because they're currently relying on signs. Yeah, see in San Diego, California, where I grew up, there was a the city made a big push because we had a lot of surfers and yeah. water people, just like we do here. And I think everybody I knew knew how to deal with those. Um, there was some talk about some brochures and hotels. I think that came up. Uh, was that on the safety or was that on the cleaning or the uh, um, safety? Safety? But I don't know if explains how to get out of the room. But, but I think it's a great idea and I think we should bring it up. I will bring that up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dan? Oh, Polly, I know you're relatively new to this uh, group, the ISAC group. Carter, you've been on there forever. I'd like to see this board consider uh, coming up with two or three significant points with a new city manager and uh, hopefully there'll be a, a, a new found focus on the island. And I think most people know I, I pretty strongly feel that we don't get our fair share of representation out of the city. But uh, what I'd like to see is us come up with two or three real focal points that you and uh, Carter can uh, take before the ISAC and, and drive home. I await your orders. what, <laughs> <laughs> Just give me one. That's oh, yeah, what, what perfect one you just came up with is, is a, uh, a, a, a piece on the island. Okay. That's, that's a perfect example, but I don't want to sit here and speak for everybody. I think we, as a group, and talking with our our folks in the neighborhood, we can come up with two or three to really drive home and not just have a whole litany of about 10 or 12. There's three really important ones to the group that y'all can well, focus I, I, on. I'd like to get her involved in some talking, <coughs> ask questions. Stuff like that too. You know, I think it's a good idea. You know, that this group get together and come up with. Be careful what you ask for. Yeah. <laughs> well, good luck, Sheila. Any any more comments or questions? Yes, sir. I used to go to a Guam two to three times a year with the military, and one of the things they did, well, the military, no matter how many times you went, you had to sit through a 20-minute film on how to survive a riptide and sign it. But every hotel a brochure that they handed you when you checked in. And in the, the, tele, the hotel instruction channel, if anybody cared watching it, there was a 20-minute video uh, that showed you how to escape a riptide. And in spite of that, they had a death a month in this one lagoon. So, I think it's time to do something about so it. So just, that's a suggestion. Put a brochure and a video in every single hotel. Thank you, Nick. 
Anybody else? What about the volunteers? The volunteers. Did we have that? Well, they had talked about moving them, and, yeah, they, did. and they did move them. Without talking to other guys, right? somebody's going to get their head chopped off. We uh, talked about that last meeting. Well, we talked, we? they're doing a study on it. And they told them not to move them yet, and they did. And they moved them anyway. Yeah, all the way down to the end. I was mortified. I sent pictures to all over the country. So is that an issue we ought to be? Well, hell yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's one of your three, Dan. <laughs> well, it's not a PLA issue, but, you know, it's kind of, uh, uh, you know, we talked about it a little bit, and they were, you know, and A&M's doing the study of, of, of the measurement between the you know, the bulkhead, the seawall, and the water, and when it gets below 130 feet, yeah. here, um, you're supposed to, but it, it's got to be seven consecutive days, medium water time, and all this sort of stuff, you know. But um, I, I was out there, uh, I don't know, I guess like Thursday, um, when they first day they moved them, and there was clearly 125 feet or so between. So, I don't know. We, we've still not gotten an explanation, and I've asked Jay to, to get an answer, and he, he hasn't gotten anything yet. About I mean, who authorized him to be moved? I mean, nobody did do our club. Right. I think it was 150 feet, so I don't know if. But what, well, like I said, yeah, maybe y'all could look into it and go oh, we'll look into it. <laughs> <laughs> we can do an R. We don't film who did it. Oh, right. okay. All right. Anybody else? Holly. Thank you. Nice Thank, you. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. Okay. Next on the agenda, members' comments. Leading off, uh, Jim McFadden. Yes. The name's on here. You're thinking, what is Jim going to say? <laughs> <laughs> about the moving forward uh, electronically as an organization. So two years ago, we began filming. And if you look at the room now, there's a dozen people in the room, maybe a little more, but there's 15 or 20 that are online, at least in this one site. And over the next week or two, a couple of hundred people will watch the videos. So I remember there was a time they were talking about building a building, and Carter said, well, how big of a building should we build? because of the size of the room. So the community has shifted to the video, and we have two cameras here. The, the cell phone is live streaming, and that service is a bit spotty, but it happens as it's happening now, and people comment as they feel. The Cyclops-looking camera is our HD camera. Higher quality, higher sound, it takes a little bit of processing. That's what we keep long-term to build a community record. That's what Kelly, as secretary, is looking at to review minutes. Um, the only purpose for these two cameras is to film these meetings. So I'd like to offer tonight to loan that equipment to the POA for the next year, if that's what it takes, and to work with the POA so that the POA can take over the filming of the meetings. We can talk about, you guys can talk about policy for people to make live comments, but certainly the HD image should be saved for long term, and the storage of it is all but free. Exactly. So um, I'd, like to, I'd like, to, like the board to consider the offer of using this equipment, and I'll work with you guys to, to try to learn how to do it. And then down the road, if you want your own equipment, you want to approach, you want to hire somebody, that's your decision down the road. The second part of this is these microphones. So because we have so many people that are coming in online, the way they hear what you're saying is when you speak to the microphones. So these are a little clumsy. We're working on the, the details of uh, 
try to get them to not squelch and so forth. So we're working on that. I'm going to be working with Jim about to add some desktop microphones too. So those that don't want to wear the, the remotes can do something different. But but still, it's a it should be an improvement. And as a next step, a few months down the road, we're going to be able to plug the plug the audio directly into the cameras, so that you're going to get the highest quality on the cameras, not necessarily in the room. So a little bit of a pain, but I'll keep reminding folks, pick up the microphone and use it, even if it, it does that kind of noise every once in a while, because it does help the members on term. It doesn't pick up uh, just talking? Uh, it, it will pick up, th those microphones over there will pick it up, but eventually when they plug the audio directly, it will take those microphones off, mm -hmm. and you're not gonna be able to get it. So this is gonna be what we really take. If we get high enough quality audio, you can actually close caption through, through Facebook services. So those who are hearing impaired are going to be able to actually use closed captioning at the meetings as well. So I just think it's a higher level of service. I would like to see eventually the HD videos be on the POA website within a few days of the meeting. And you may eventually, if you have town halls or other, other committees, okay. Kelly get disconnected. So anyway, thank you. 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 This particular issue has been under study by the POA board here for some time. I remember two and a half years ago, two years ago, I put together a cost study to buy the equipment versus uh, hiring a service to come in. So um, if Jim's going to lend us this gear, we'll figure it out. And, Take it over and the VOA will do the recording and story and disconnecting his phone. <laughs> hey, I love the phone. You're back. Take it over and the VOA will do the recording. Thank you. Okay, you're a little delay there. Yeah, the Facebook is about a 15 second delay behind, so. All right. Thank you. Yep. Okay, moving on. Uh, Nancy Tresser. Come on up, Nancy. Sure. Happy Memorial Day late to everybody. Thank you to all the vets in the audience that serve and all the families. I'm going to get the old microphone on here. Oh. Okay, I'm here to talk about Down Park in the gardens. Uh, approximately nine years ago, the POA adopted that section of the park. It's about one third the area. Put in the gardens, the signs erected, the gardens have been going on. There's been over probably 600 gardeners in and out. Uh, with that, over the years, the gardeners are now paying a $25 one-time fee to get a garden. And that money is put into an account, and uh, that is POA money, a like revenue source. Uh, there are needs, resources, that as the gardens age, remulching, relaxing some of the gates, mowing, and Diane, the assistant administrator, has been dealing and very, very open with Dr. Dunsett about hearing the needs. And, but the response time, and I want to remind the board that since we adopted that area, new members, old members, we are kind of beholden to take care of it because of the neighbors around and also the gardeners. So as the requests come in for monetary uh, compensation. I would appreciate the board thinking about, and Mr. Smock also, um, putting forth some of this money that's in the, this account that's being paid to fix some of the things that need to be fixed or refurbished, etc. We just recently, in the past two weeks, had a neighbor donate a beautiful queen palm, and I invite the people to go over and see it. The fellow donated the palm planted it with a buddy of his, and it's in the grove of trees. So the, the community is donating things. So I hope that the board would consider using some of these funds to remulch, relatch, and mow, and keep those gardens up. Uh, it's, it's a good resource for the community. Uh, a lot of people enjoy it. And thank you. And I hope that COVID tomorrow boat race gets finished quickly. Mm -hmm. Or soon. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Brian, how's Come on up, Brian. 
Whoops. Go. Oops. Broken the Bible. Good thing I don't live on it. <laughs> I'm going to segue right off of what Nancy was talking about. We just went through our first holiday weekend, big summer weekend here on the island. I, I'm Brian Hauskamek, incidentally, on Dawson Marinus Drive. Um, it's a uh, landlocked home there, and I rely on the ramps to take my boat out uh, for vacation and, and for weekend type activities. What I noticed this weekend, um, on Saturday, it was just impossible to get to the ramps. But uh, Sunday, I was able to get my boat out uh, finally late in the evening. But what I noticed, and I referred this actually to uh, Kelly, and I know Kelly is the, asking the board to take a look at this, but I want to reinforce the idea that we really need to tighten down on who we're allowing to use both the boat ramps themselves as well as the parking. On Sunday, uh, about half, I, I could take my golf cart around quite a bit as well, just to kind of see what's going on and just watching boats. But I noticed that there's at least half of the people that are using these ramps don't have stickers on them. They either don't have the vehicle sticker or in most cases they don't have the uh, trailer stickers on there. So we have a lot of people that are using these ramps um, that should be able to be used by the POA members. And yesterday, uh, Monday, yesterday, I also noticed that in some cases, like even right out here across from the POA building, there's a vacant lot out there. There were several boat trailers that were parked illegally in the vacant lot out there. So there's a lot of illegal parking of these trailers in addition to, you know, not being, if they're not in the, the um, ramp area itself, they're on the streets where they're illegally parked. Um, I know of a friend who just bought a boat, so she's also very interested in using her ramps. So I really encourage you guys to get out there and look at your policy, because I think what I read in one of the documents I saw online was that uh, the city did not dedicate the uh, our canals and waterways to public use. So in my mind, that means these ramps are not really dedicated to public use. They're POA use, and we need to look at that and tighten down on how we're doing it. And in any case, we're getting some enforcement out there. I'm not sure what the status is of enforcement right now. I haven't seen any. I used to see little stickers on vehicles. I've never seen a vehicle towed. I've never seen a vehicle with the, the clamps on the wheels or anything like that. I think we need to start getting in there. It's going to get worse and worse. A lot of new homes are being built here. A lot of new people are coming into the area. They're going to be wanting to use these ramps. Second point is that some of the ramps, like particularly Cartagena, are in really bad shape now. They're getting worse and worse. If you look at the area just off the concrete on Cartagena, where it uh, converts from concrete to asphalt, there's a big section of asphalt missing, and you're starting to get a big divot in there if people take their boats in and out. So I think this is another area where we need to be looking at the maintenance of these ramps. We're in a, a waterfront community, and we need to start focusing on these ramps. I know we're doing it at um, uh, Cobra de Barro, and I'm thinking for Cartagena, um, Marvin, you may want to take a look at and possibly amending that contract to see if they can do some of this maintenance or repair work at some of these other ramps, especially the urgent stuff where it's really deteriorating. That's all. Thank you. And welcome to the new board members. I think I had a chance to say, especially you, John. So, thank you. Uh, I have some questions. Who's, uh, who's fixing for lands? Uh, you know, around here, boat lands. Who's fixing? Uh, uh, association fix or our uh, city fix? You know, they, who's fixing their lands? You know, that, yeah, public land. The public? Yeah. What? I'm sorry, ma'am, we didn't quite catch your question. Okay, I'm sorry because of my pronunciation. Well, who's responsible <laughs> okay. for fixing? Who, yeah, who's fixing? No. Yeah. The POA is responsible for fixing the boat ramps within the POA. Yeah, but I I saw a lot of outsiders coming and using. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, you know, just uh, yeah, what he's saying was that we have to have. Uh, you know, for revenue, for POA, yeah. oh, give them <laughs> ticket stuff, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, one more quick one, Marvin. Sure. Um, on the uh, volleyball courts. Still, yeah. still, still looking for volleyball um, equipment in there. Hopefully your report will have something to do to yeah, save on that. We'll pass that one to Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Don't even talk to me about the volleyball. <laughs> Okay, a quick explanation. Uh, many years ago, the POA tried to make the boat ramps private and cut out the public use. They, uh, we received a letter from the IRS, it was 1994-92 back in that, uh, that said we couldn't close the boat ramps to the public because in order to maintain um, uh, our nonprofit status, we had to do something good for the community, 
and letting people use the boat ramps to get out there is what the IRS required at that time. That's an old ruling on their part. Um, I found that while browsing through the file folders there one day. Um, we could probably uh, make another argument today that we do a number of things for the community beyond the boat ramps. We maintain certain uh, medians. Um, we take care of Village Park. So it might be time with the advice of our CPA because you know you don't want to poke a sleeping bear at the IRS to uh, uh, get another ruling on whether or not we could close our boat ramps to the public. But that's the reason that they're open to the public, uh, at least the, from an IRS point of view and a not-for-profit point of view. Okay. Um, in terms of which boat ramps need to be fixed first, there are many that have potholes and drainage problems. Uh, we had. Pete and Danny, two employees of the POA, go out and survey them last month, maybe three weeks ago, and make a list of who needs to get what fixed first. Okay? So that's on the agenda to get repaired uh, as we finish up a couple of other projects and we'll start those. We'd also like to put in better decking around the ramps so people don't have to walk on a plank about this wide and fall into their boat. So that's on the agenda as well. So there's a lot of things being considered, a lot of things working. Um, it just takes a little time, and it takes money. Yes, ma'am. Um, Marvin, didn't you say also there's a distinction between using the ramp and where you park? Yes, the, the ramp is open to the public, but the parking lot itself is POA property. And in theory, the public can use the ramp, but they can't park in the parking lot. And that's what the stickers are all about. Now, I know we had Pete out not too long ago putting the orange stickers on trailers, uh, notifying the people that they couldn't park it there. Part of our problem is many of the residents of the POA park there with no sticker. They just don't want to pay the 10 bucks to get a sticker, I guess. So we're a little hesitant to who gets towed and who doesn't. We don't tell any, anybody at this point because we don't want to tow a resident's boat trailer off. That wouldn't be uh, very nice. So that's the status on all of that. Ten bucks. Ten bucks, yeah. All right. Um, anybody else? Let's see. Oh, uh, John Weiss had asked for a few minutes to say hi and introduce himself since he's brand new. Thank you, Brian. Good evening. I'm John Weiss, your newest board member. I want to start out by thanking the other board members for selecting me. I was truly stunned when it was unanimous. Carter took a huge leap of faith because he really didn't know much about me at all. Dan took two hours on a nasty rainy morning that we both should have been sleeping in to interview me and find out who I was. I appreciate that. It was very, very professional. I also want to make a comment that uh, in my interaction with Jim and his crew at the office, they're wonderful professional people. I'm very, very proud to be part of this organization. The other thing I would like to bring up, if there's anybody from Sea Pines who would, would like to contact me, I would like to know the origin of what happened. Maybe we can represent the dry lot people a little bit better. Uh, just kind of need to know how, how we got into this mess. Anyway, thank you for your, uh, your trust. All right, let's move on. President's comments, the recount. Okay. Mike, is your mic on? Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, that's on. Can you hear it? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, obviously, our board election was very close. At this point in time, there were only three votes that separated the third place from second place finisher. And of course, we had two openings. So at a uh, razor, micro razor thin uh, count. The POA did not count a single ballot. That was not what we did. We hired A&M to count the ballots. Uh, they did that. They gave a count based on preliminary numbers they had that uh, Saturday at the meeting. Then per their contract with us, they went back and did a more formalized count or a second count, if you will. 
provided us with a detailed explanation of how many votes there were for which candidate, and then they certified it uh, under the, the, the stamp of the Texas A&M University. Okay, that uh, uh, count form is online at the POA for anybody that wants to go and look at it and see how many ballots were counted, how many were went to which candidate, how many proxies were counted, and how many votes were disqualified because nobody signed the ballot, that kind of thing. So that's where we are with that. Now, since that time, a number of people had asked for a recount uh, in the 40s, as a matter of fact, but only, and it's required to get a, restart, a recount started to put money down. Okay, that's what the Texas Property Code says uh, has to happen. So, uh, Nita Smith, God bless her, put her money up, $3,500, which was the estimated bill that we sent to her when she said she wanted a recount. We sent that same estimated amount on an invoice to everybody that wanted to put up a request for a recount, all 40 some of them. Nita was the one that came up with the $3,500. That's an estimate, okay? Depending on what the actual fee is to do the recount, it could be less, at which point Nita, assuming that the recount stayed with Kelly as the victor, would uh, uh, get a refund. If it goes over that, then she might have to pay extra, and the same for the POA. If the POA, uh, if the recount turns out that uh, uh, Brian McCabe would take the second spot, then the POA pays for the recount, whether it's under or over that amount, they're responsible. The legislature made it that way so that people wouldn't just willy-nilly ask for recounts for every election. They made you put your money where your mouth is, so to speak. All right, so that's where we are. And then there's a procedure to follow after that. It's very detailed in the property code, so we're fortunate that all we have to do is follow the cookbook and we'll get there. Now, having said that, we have to find a recounter, someone to do the recount, all right? Uh, some of the people put up names from out of the 40 some people that wanted a recount, all right? But none of those people actually put up the money, okay? So as Nita Smith was the only one to put up the money, her offering someone to count them is the only one that counts from the 40 some people, okay? That makes sense? She's the one with the right since she put up the money. Nita personally has not given us a single name uh, that we might agree or disagree with. We've put up two names and she's disagreed with those. You don't have to give a reason according to the code. If you don't like it, don't take it. That's the end of it. You don't get to negotiate. Okay? Now the property code goes one step further and it lists five classes of uh, uh, a government official, if you will, that is automatic, okay? You don't have to have an agreement between the POA and Nita Smith, okay? Uh, justices of the peace, for example. Uh, elections administrators and so on. There's about five different categories. We have been working to find somebody from that list of five categories to do the recount, all right? Uh, we've tried justices of the peace. Well, the problem with those folks are if they take a couple of days off to do the recount, now the county has to pay to bring in a substitute judge and the counties don't want to do that. So they won't let the people have time off to go and do that, all right? Uh, most recently, we found two elections administrators, one from San Patricio County and one from uh, Aransas County that have expressed an interest, but they're seeking permission from their county judge, the head of the county court, to uh, do this. So we hope to get at least one of those two to do this, and the, the recount, if they can do it, will either be next week or the week after. And that's where we stand. The law guarantees a recount. It's going to happen. It may not have happened as fast, but we're within the law, and there we go. All right, uh, we also want to make sure we have an absolute person who has no conflict of interest with the POA, okay? We want an independent, 
person, and that's why we've sort of reached outside the county a little bit to find someone who doesn't have relatives or family here on the island. So we don't want anybody at the end of the recount to be able to say, aha, look at this, it was, you know, influenced unduly. We want to make it as fair, straightforward as we possibly can. All right, we also have to coordinate with Professor Jorgensen from the a and He and a and are in legal possession of the ballots. The law says they must possess them for six months before they can be thrown away. It puts the obligation on them to secure them. Okay. So the recount will more likely than not be done at the a and facility somewhere in a conference room someplace, and the recounters will count and uh, Jorgensen, Dr. Jorgensen will provide the box of sealed ballots and there you go. Does that make sense? I hope so. It's <laughs> a long ways to go, isn't it? All right. Uh, litigation. That's much shorter. Uh, we all know that Brett Moore filed suit against the POA uh, to stop and filed a temporary injunction uh, the board from appointing a seventh board member. Subsequently, he dropped that lawsuit, thus the injunction went away, and we appointed John Weissen. Here he is. And that's about all that needs to be said for now on the litigation. Late statements. All right, we have sent out about a thousand late statements, Jim. Billing statements for people that have not promptly paid the CAM fees, and we're waiting for those to come in. Uh, we're working with our attorney uh, and a, a collections policy we have to file with the county a late payment uh, schedule if you want to use a payment over time, a payoff, rather than paying it a lump if you want to pay $100 a month, it has to be set up and filed with the county. That's the state law again. So we're working with our attorney to make that happen uh, so we can collect what's due to us. Uh, it's hundreds of thousands of dollars. Okay. Uh, we talked about the boat ramps, sea pines. We've had a bit of a development on the sea pine situation. Uh, apparently, talking with our attorney, Mr. Cagle, uh, Linda Albans, Melinda. Melinda, I'm sorry, thank you. Yeah, I keep calling her Melinda. Melinda Albans uh, is the person that filed at the county uh, a document purported to be an amendment to their uh, covenants claiming that it would excuse them from paying CAM fees and removing them from the BOA. All right. She has a new lawyer. Thank goodness for that. Uh, his name is Brian Stone, and Mr. Stone contacted uh, Mr. Cagle, the BOA attorney. Blessing for that. We've been trying to get some communication going there. We invited Melinda to come into the office two times, and she was apparently unavailable to come in. But now that we've got a channel of communication between our attorney and her attorney, hopefully we can get something uh, moving on that. Now, I'm told by Mr. Cagle that when he spoke with the attorney today, this Brian Stone, Melinda's attorney, that they discussed uh, the validity of the amendment filed. And apparently Mr. Stone agrees with our attorney that that didn't get the job done. And so Mr. Stone is going to apparently be rewriting that and coming up one that will with one that will work. Okay, so we'll keep you posted on that. And that's a good thing. We do not want to stop the Sea Pines people from leaving the POA if that's what they really want to do. And if they've got the legal uh, uh, wherewithal to do it, the right documents. All right, have a nice life. Okay, so that uh, is pretty much on my agenda. We don't normally take questions, but on Sea Pines, I'll, I'll I appreciate take it. I'm, I'm a new resident of Sea Pines, and I do have a couple of questions. Go right uh, ahead, sir. Is, is there any, it seems there's a lot of misinformation. And I, uh, talking to a few of my neighbors, I'm not certain that everybody really understands what's happened or what is, is happening. Uh, is, there, is there any format to get some accurate facts? Right. I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, Jim and our attorney have been drafting a letter 
okay, to send to every Sea Pines resident explaining the history and where it's at. So if you want to consider our letter accurate, then you'll have the full story. That would be fantastic. Yeah, it's coming. Uh, we had to hold up on it because it's new development with the new attorney. I think putting something in there about what it actually means, what, what, what they're actually changing and what we're not changing would be helpful. Uh, just the boat ramp conversation is, is a good example of that. I think. All right. Uh, we might have shot in the name. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Thank you for your, your comments. Um, once we get the letter out, depending on how the two lawyers work it out, we may have a town hall just for the Sea Pines residents to come in and get all their answers. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, moving on, the executive director report. Jim? I'm sorry. Your report, please. Good evening, everyone. Um, on a sad note, I want to uh, advise everyone, I'm sure everyone knows about now, but Kathy who, Schofield, who's one of our own, her husband uh, passed away very suddenly uh, late Friday. And um, uh, people have put on Facebook about a memorial service that will be taking place tomorrow. Uh, I want to let everyone know that the office will be closing at 2.30 tomorrow afternoon for the day so that the staff can attend the memorial service on the beach uh, and there be there to support uh, Kathy. So please keep Kathy and her family uh, in your hearts, minds, and prayers, if you would, please. Uh, at the last board meeting on April 27th, during the member comments section, uh, a property owner raised what I consider to be some very serious allegations concerning the ACC, the ACC coordinator, and how each performed its work. Uh, Robert Pruski, who's the chair of the ACC, is here, and if he'd like to discuss some of these issues, that's fine, but um, I conducted an investigation based on the information that I received at the meeting from the property owner. I will say that I did email that property owner who made these allegations following that meeting, and I did not get a response. The response I got was, well, essentially, I said all I had to say at the meeting. So that's that. Anyway, I spoke with or attempted to speak with the individuals that the property owner seemed to identify. Based on the information that she gave me, I was able to identify the property owners involved. A couple, as the property owner identified them on April 27th, uh, did not reply to my email inquiries. Another property owner was rather upset that his name had been brought into this and frankly his integrity questioned. He is a physician. He also happens to be good friends with the ACC, co ACC coordinator's husband and all of this predated Miss um, Cooley's employment with the POA. There was no quid pro quo. Um, I'm going to take the, uh, he happens to be a physician, I'm going to take the doctor's word for it because he was given every opportunity to say I was treated unfairly or maligned. He did not do so. I received an email from the property owner who made these allegations suggesting that Ms. Cooley was hysterical and that the doctor involved did not want to have any conversation with her further. In my own conversation with the doctor on the phone, he said, absolutely not. There was no hysteria, histrionics, drama. And again, he had wished that the property owner in question had not raised the information so that I could locate him and ask him about this. I think this gentleman just wanted his privacy. So again, there is no quid pro quo. Uh, if Robert has something different he'd like to say, he'll have that opportunity. But the ACC and the ACC coordinator and the POA did its job. It did its job properly, fundamentally, truthfully. So perhaps that will 
answer some questions. Coba de Barro, everybody's favorite topic. So the board has reached agreement with the contractor to repair Coba de Barro. The contractor is Pezzi Construction, Inc., name that should be familiar to everyone here. Uh, the contract has been sent to Mr. Pezzi. Mr. Pezzi has signed it. Uh, I've asked to meet with him to go over some preliminary issues, and he will commence work. The cost to repair the Coba de Barro ramp will be approximately $58,000 which is a large chunk of change. As to the other boat ramps, we're just going to have to take them in turn. Um, we have more demands on the money than the money itself, presently. And I know people don't like to hear that, but that is the fact. As I've often said, you may not like what I have to say to you, but it is the truth. An inconvenient truth, perhaps, at times. We also, in addition to the Coba de Barro repair contract, have two contracts. One is to, on a full-time basis, maintain Billish Park. That is irrigation, uh, the lawn mowing itself, as well as the fertilizing, the weeding, the feeding, the herbicide, the pesticide, any side uh, involved. Uh, the present uh, uh, contractor, Doug Tipton from Tind Tipton Landscaping, for his own reasons, chose not to bid at the time that that contract was put for bid. But he's done a fantastic job in the interim while we secured the contract. He's been very responsive. And if you ever have an opportunity to talk with Doug Tipton, please say thank you. I think he did a great job there, especially knowing that he was in it for the short term. And then lastly, in terms of contracts, we have signed a contract with uh, Artistic Construction to maintain the canals. Up until now, I believe, the POA has approached it as you call, you say, hey, there's a car, there's a deck, there's a dock, there's a body in the canal. And then we send someone out to take care of one of the above or more than one of the above. I think it's important and the we had a workshop with the board to discuss this that for the POA membership, they know that we are doing the routine maintenance things that we should be doing. And so Artistic will, once a month, sweep the canals, starting at one end, going to the other. Obviously, if between the time that they do that, there is an emergency situation, you know, a mysterious car is found in a canal, for example, not that that ever happens. Um, you know, artistic will go out, they have a barge, they have the equipment to um, clean the canal, repair the canal. Now we can argue whether once a month is enough, is it too much, is it not enough, often enough, but that is the, pr the plan um, as of now. Uh, Marvin mentioned the collections policy. Yes, the POA needs a collections policy. The, collect the POA has not had a legally um, filed collections policy for, I, I don't know, how long? Ever. Okay. Ever. Well, ever is a long time. So I have received a draft of the collections policy from uh, Mr. Cagle and his uh, uh, counsel that I will be presenting to the board. Um, along with that collections policy, we also have, as Marvin said, approximately $700,000 in past due can fees. That's right, $700,000. Looking at these past due dues or past due can fees, some go back years. Eight, nine, ten years. <coughs> you can imagine that we will play hell collecting all of that money. And so the board will need to decide how it wishes to proceed with that collection. Does it want to use Mr. Cagle? Does it want to hire a third-party collections firm? What the cost of the collection will be? And how we figure all of that out? Um, Marvin is quite correct. We sent out about 1,000 um, statements, past due statements. Uh, we have gotten some collections in. Uh, this Friday, we'll run a report and see uh, what we have. For those who have not paid, they will get a second statement with an accompanying letter 
is a little stronger than what they got in the first place was just simply a statement that asked you please pay. So if you know of people, I don't need to know names, don't want to know names, but if you know of people that are past due, please, please, please ask them to pay the can fees. We need the money. We're not being greedy, but if you want the boat ramps repaired, if you want the bulkheads maintained, if you want Village Park maintained, the mediums, on and on and on, we need that money. $700,000, if someone could write you a check, right? Well, not you can check personally, but if someone could write the POA a check for $700,000, that would be huge right now. That would be most, most welcome. So please keep that um, in mind, if you would. Um, there are a lot of things going on. So we have the collections policy that needs to be part of the uh, POA's documents. We are chasing down people for money, as I mentioned. The board has already been through uh, one demonstration of the new TOPS software program, the so-called TOPS 1, which is completely different from TOPS Professional, which we've been presently using or using since, I believe, 2009 or 2010. Uh, on June 5th, the board will, with a different software provider, go through another demonstration. That company is Caliber. Tops and Caliber are the two big dogs, if you will, on the porch in the property management software world. There will be a second, more focused demo going back to Tops, I believe on June 3rd, we're finalizing that date, where point questions, specific questions, if you will, be, will be asked of the provider. Obviously, the biggest and most important function of the software is the accounting package and all the things that go with that. Not that workflows and compliance are not important, they are, but the accounting component is probably the most important of any software package. So we are doing a lot, a lot is going on right now. Um, lastly, I would just like to comment. Um, a staff member a couple of weeks ago sent me a screenshot from a uh, closed, I believe it is, Facebook uh, site. The comment on the closed Facebook site is, and I'll leave out the salty language, uh, this is in, regarding the most recent litter critter. And people are commenting about litter critter, where, when, why, how, that type of thing. And a property owner commented, quote, just take your stuff to the POA office, it will blend in with the rest of the S dot dot T over there. I contacted the property owner by phone, left a message saying, you know, I would like to talk with you. That's it. Never heard a word. Uh, as I have said before, this kind of language doesn't help. It may make someone feel good for a moment, especially someone who is sitting on a keyboard but doesn't have the guts, frankly, to return a call and have a civil conversation about this incident with me and what may be the problem. Okay, I'm objecting to the language, not perhaps the underlying issue that we can be better. Of course we can. So again, I would ask you that if you have issues, please contact me, email me, call me. Don't post something on next door necessarily. Don't post it on Facebook. We don't have the time to comb through all of the posts and look for potential questions. Go to the source, come to the office, or please contact a board member so that we can get you an accurate answer and we're not down in the weeds playing on the playground like this. Please. Um, I think that is about it, except to say that the next board meeting will be two excuse me, Tuesday, June 25th, four weeks from today. We are going to hold it, I believe, at the Holiday Inn Express, where we were for the special meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we're gonna try it, see how it goes. Um, one of the things about the having it at the Holiday Inn, and I think ISAC people can testify to this, is all we have to do is walk in. We put out our name plates, we put our bottles of water out, our sound system and we're good to go. When we're done, we take our stuff and we leave. And the setup and breakdown of the room, the, 
cleaning of the room is handled by the Holiday Inn Express staff. So obviously that will be in the next uh, agenda, next notice of meeting, but just please keep that in mind that it will be Tuesday, June 25th, 5.30 at the Holiday Inn Express. Again, I thank you for the good emails that I've received, the, the sound emails that I've received, the great phone calls that I've had recently, especially with the number of Sea Pines individuals, who as the gentleman in the back said a little while ago, were looking for answers, and they were willing to engage in a good conversation with me, the dialogue that is so important in any conversation to get to the facts and remove misconceptions, rumors, miscommunication, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So thank you for that. Keep the cards and letters coming. And uh, if not before, I will see you on Tuesday, June 25th. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, moving on, consent agenda, secretary's report. Kelly, are you still there? Marvin, yes, ma if I may, before, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm, I'm sorry, Kelly, I'm not trying to steal your thunder. This is Jim. Uh, I do have updated uh, April financials that were brought to me by Anita Sanchez. Um, do you okay. want to discuss those or? We'll take that up with the Secretary or okay. the Treasury's report. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Kelly? Yes, uh -huh. yes okay. uh -huh. I know everybody has a copy of the um, uh, the recent uh, minutes that uh, they have with you, but I also want to uh, read into the record our, our, our email votes that we've had over the past month. We had two board email votes, uh, one on May 2nd, uh, that was uh, originally started with a motion made by the party to take, made a motion to accept uh, Mr. Pezzi's uh, May 1 bid for the repairs of the covered borrow boat ramp uh, in the amount of $58,968. Uh, motion was seconded by Director Dan Brown. Uh, vote result called by President Marvin Jones. Um, motion was passed by the name of this vote. All six board members voted yes to the motion. Okay. Uh, I don't know where the other one go. I lost my second one. Hold on. Where's the code? I'm happy here. Second one. I apologize. I had it printed out here. Where did it go? Hold on. Nothing for for now. So, hold on. Let me pull it up on my computer if I have the technology. Kelly, are you looking for um, the motion that was made by you? Pulling it up right now. Got it. Okay, uh, email vote on May 24th, uh, uh, motion made by myself, Secretary Kelly McFadden, to move that the vinyl spent stipend reimbursement program previously offered to members of the PITOA that was operated without board approval, be immediately terminated. Motion was seconded by Treasurer Nick Pelosi. Uh, by email, President Marvin Jones called the motion. Kelly's motion to terminate the vinyl fence passes with seven yes votes, so it was unanimous. And that was the only two email votes in the past month. All right. Very good. Thank you, Kelly. Um, mm -hmm. any, Thank you. Any comments on the other board meeting minutes? The uh, February 26th, April 27th, May 13th. Otherwise, we will see if we can agree to them and move on. I was on the board in February, so I'll abstain from that one. Sure. Yeah, and John, you should probably abstain as well when, for any of these you weren't on the board. So. <laughs> any other comments, Kelly? No, I mean, uh, uh, Jim did ask me to beef up um, a little bit on the April board meeting, which I did. I submitted those to him. And, uh, but other than that, that was the only comments I received back. All right. Oh, good. All right. So, um, we don't need to have a motion and a vote on this. Are these minutes acceptable to the board? Yes? yes. Anyone yes. disagree? All right. They're accepted. Moving on. Committee reports. Architectural Control Committee. Robert? Robert Prusky. 
chairman of the committee. Thank you, sir. Mr. President. <laughs> Hang on a minute. Oh, I can talk loud. Can you hear me? Yeah. You actually need to be into the mic to catch the, the online. Uh, how's that? Did everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. All right. Good. So I'd like to thank Carter, Nick, and Marvin for attending our ACC meetings and would like to invite other board members to please come out and visit us as well. We love your input, okay? John, very nice to meet you, sir. At this time, I'd like to ask the board to appoint Paul and my green light now. Oh, are you kidding me? This <laughs> one. This stuff never works, eh? Okay, we're, no, we're, we're back on, okay. At this time, I'd like to ask the board to appoint Paul Brady to our committee. You should have a copy of his application in your packet. Paul is a local businessman and a great islander. We currently only have three members, and we traditionally should have five. Paul would be a great asset to our committee. Thank you, Mom. Uh, here's his. Oh, here they come. Okay. Uh, Carter and I had a chance to uh, meet with Mr. Brayley the other night, and uh, he's got years of experience in construction. Uh, he indicates he has the time to be on the committee. I think he'd be a great addition. I think the other committee members uh, would appreciate getting them on board as well. Carter, would you like to come in? I'll, I'll make a motion to appoint. Oh, that's okay. Go right ahead. I'll second. <laughs> I have a motion to appoint Paul Brady to our committee. Second. Okay. Paul, second. All right. Is there a second? I'll second it. It's been moved and second, and now to discussion. Marvin. Sir. Marvin. How many more seats do we have available on that particular uh, committee? If, if you guys appoint, if y'all guys appoint him today, I'm still going to be short one person. And total of how many members? I'd like that. We'd like that five. Thank you. Other discussion? But the, but the problem was that some of the forms required three signatures, so they had to have a 100% vote, you know, and it, we, they were running into trouble. And so four is good, five is better. All right, very good. More discussion? Marta. Um, I like the background from what I can see here. I, this looks like a gentleman who will understand the nuances of uh, construction and building and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. All right, call the question. All those in, for, in favor of uh, appointing Mr. Braley to the ACC committee, Signify by raising your right hand. One, two, three, four, five, six. Kelly. Seven. Seven. All right. Can't see your hand, Kelly, because you're raising it. A little higher? Oh, uh, yes, sir. Okay. It's really hot. Seven. All right. The motion passes with a uh, unanimous vote. You will advise Mr. Um, okay. So, who, who made the second? I'm sorry. It, it all ran together quite quickly. Uh, John, John Weiss the second, made yeah. the second. John White. Okay. Mm -hmm. John John does the second. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right. Anything else, Robert? I, I, I would. Um, I'd like to let everybody out in Facebook land who's watching. Um, we are looking for a fifth person. So if you know someone who uh, would be a good fit for us, please send them to the office to fill out an application. And I hope to be doing this again next month, getting my fifth up there. All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Robert. For you. Okay, moving on. The treasurer's report. Nick? We have uh, looked at all these statements, investments, and other financials, and they have all been reconciled. Every month, I sit down with our bookkeeper and executive director, and we clean up and straighten and simplify a couple of our matters. Every time we do that, we find a new problem. So I have a, I'm in the process of arranging a meeting with our CPA. But at that time, our board members can meet and bring up any questions, any formatting, anything at all. And we can make the one effort, all of us in one room at one time, to make it more simplified, more streamlined, so that someone other than the CPA can understand this. Uh, I would like to just hold off on all discussions until we do that and not make any changes. So I would ask for someone who would uh, move to accept the financials as they are 
and we'll meet the CPA in about two weeks. Which, which financial months are we talking about? Uh, I think it is what, March and April. Should we hold off on April? No, just including April. Mm -hmm. We will not vote on them separately because of the two months in question. The one in March was the uh, transfer of some money between accounts, so that just had to be changed as far as what line went where. That was a minor issue. All right. Well, let's take uh, March 1st. That seems to have been cleaned up. Uh, can we have an agreement to our motion to uh, accept March? Make the motion to accept March. All right, is there a second? Second? Discussion? Uh, Marlon. Um, yes, sir. I, I, obviously, there were some discrepancies in the April numbers, and I had some issues with the March numbers as well. Um, I, I did just receive moments ago the April number would certainly look a little more in line, but I don't think I've had the opportunity to dissect this uh, to be able to vote affirmatively for this. I'm not suggesting that we won't be there, but uh, I think meeting with the CPA, I'd prefer to uh, to, to move this vote till uh, next month after we met the CPA and then we don't get these at, the, at this meeting. Okay. I, I don't think March would be substantially different than April. There, there, were, there had to be some carryover, at least in my opinion. I'm not prepared to suggest one way or the other. I'm not suggesting there's anything wrong. I just think that we we, we're close to getting it fixed. I just, rather than approve the match, I just like to wait. All right, further discussion? I have to agree with Dan. I think we'll go ahead and take care of business properly. Microphone. Well, I think we are taking care of it properly. <laughs> I just wanted to agree with Dan. Okay. I think it makes more sense to put it off until we actually have answers. Okay. Anybody else? Someone wanted to make a motion to continue it to the next month, we might do that. I'll be glad to make that motion that we uh, do a continuation of the financials for one more month. All right. Second? I'll second if I can. No, Nick can second. All right. So the motion's on the table to approve the, oh, just a minute, uh, to approve the um, uh, financials for March and April been seconded however there's now an amendment to that motion to continue it until next month to vote on it it's been moved and seconded are you continuing both months or just april is that what you want to do yes. continue both months? continuing both march and april to make sure we've got them just right okay uh, any discussion on continuing mark um yeah just so everybody understands um when we started we had some significant complications with things not reconciling and numerous problems that were resolved by doing an audit bringing in a cpa and doing that so that was great the other side of this is um, operating with two systems um, with some redundancies between them um, does complicate the system and software is a lot older and if you uh, listened earlier, um, you heard about how we are looking at new software that I think will resolve all these issues for us. Um, and I look through these financials too. There's some things that um, at first look kind of different. Um, the numbers don't necessarily uh, match the statement, but that's normal. Think about it. The statement. Um, and your check register when you balance at home, your check register has all the checks you've written. Your bank statement only has the ones that have cleared, so you have outstanding checks. So some of that is just normal. But I, I you know, we all want this to be right. There is just no, no doubt about it. And a lot of people are working very hard to get this done and uh, have it done well. So. Um, um, all issues and concerns are, are dealt with, so that's it. Yeah. Um, and I'd like to I'd like to say something to you, Marvin. Sure. Um, I understand I, I understand that you know some of the totals don't quite you know we're still dealing with some of, some of that, but I think the day-to-day -day, um, numbers 
the checks that are being written and things like that. I, I think those are, we, we, we can assume those are reasonably accurate and I think that we can go ahead and get these approved and still amend them if there are some minor modifications that come out with the high level code. So that's my, that's my position on this. All right, thank you. So on the table is a motion to amend Nick's motion and continue until the motion. I'm sorry? I think Dan motion to amend. Oh, I'm sorry. Dan's motion to amend Nick's motion to carry forward till next month the vote on the financials. Okay. Any more discussion on the amendment? All right. Let's call the question and vote on that. All those in favor of carrying forward the financials to next month for a vote. Signify by raising your right hand. I'll vote for carrying them forward one month. You, you second, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Kelly? All right, one, two, three, four, five. No, I vote, I vote no on carrying it forward. All right. So the uh, amendment passes uh, six to one with Kelly opposing it. Thank you, Kelly. Sure. All right, so we'll carry that forward to next month. Uh, while we're on, Nick, do you have anything further? Uh, the only comment I would make is please remember that when we took over, we had the same vendor providing the same service that was paid from different checking accounts with different line items. An incredible mess. Yeah. And we made tremendous progress. But as I said, every time we clean up one problem, I find another one. All right. Uh, while we're on the, the money, uh, if you remember from the last meeting, I keep my own little set of uh, numbers based on bank statements. I keep up with how much gets deposited each month and how much is withdrawn each month. Real simple. Uh, so far in the month of May, with only a couple days to go, we had deposits of $59,594. That's how much in camp fees and other revenue we took in, stickers, what have you. We paid out $62,321.68. So we paid about $2,800 out more than we took in. Now that's not unusual because all of our money comes in in March, right? And uh, February and January when the CAM fees are due. So we pile up all the money early in the year and then we spend it out over the course of the year. Sometimes we have more money, generally we have more money left than we've spent and we start the next year with a little bonus. All right, so that's where we are. So every month I want to tell you my own little secret here, how I keep up with it. I also read all the financial statements, believe me. Uh, I had a conversation with our CPA about this and there are certain accounting requirements that we have to have under our investment account. Now we've talked about shortening this up a little bit, but she tells me you have to do X, Y, and Z to include it on the balance sheet. So we're going to have a meeting and get everybody straightened up on this. Uh, when you have this kind of an investment account with stocks, mutual funds, CDs, it gets divided a little differently. And we want to make sure we're following CPA guidelines on that. All right, moving on to old business. Uh, Billish Park, I think we covered that. Mm -hmm. In your report, Cabo to borrow parking lot. We've got a contract. Mr. Pezzi fires up his cement mixer and his bulldozer. We'll be getting after it. And canal maintenance. All of those we covered earlier in Jim's report. Uh, new business, we have the German bakery bulkhead. Uh, Jim, you want to cover that one? So I think as people know, the bulkhead uh, adjacent to the German bakery uh, needs serious repair. Uh, the cost to do so, the estimate to repair this is approximately $120,000, and that represents, and Carter can check me on my, my math, 149 linear feet, I believe Six. is. I'm sorry? Four to six. Okay, I'll spot you the three. Okay. Okay. Right. I, I did, okay. 146 linear feet. Um, the POA contracted with uh, Urban Engineering uh, to do a couple of things. Uh, the first thing is we have what's called a master agreement with Urban. 
which is the overall how they will do engineering when and if the POA decides that it is necessary to do so. Then there are what we call task orders, task order 1, 2, 5, 10, 20. And that is for the specific job or task, as the name suggests, involved. So we have a master agreement, and then we have task order number one. So uh, there is, uh, I believe, before the board, the opportunity to vote on this. Uh, bids were received, and uh, if unless the board wishes to continue, which maybe you, you do, but that's a little bit of the background on the uh, German bakery. Uh, we have received permission from the uh, landowner on the property that is behind the German bakery to be able to move equipment onto that. That will make the uh, process a little easier, certainly less expensive than trying to do all of this from the water side. Had the owner declined to give us permission to use uh, their, uh, their property as essentially a staging area. All right. Okay. Good enough. Um, Anything else we want to talk about? Well, did we uh, agree to a contract with to repair the bulkhead, and then it, it, it went back to the engineers for a couple of repairs, uh, uh, change in ideas, and they agreed they weren't that they were a good idea, and so now we've got it back. Have we got it back yet? Uh, do we get the the new engineering plan? Or is that just going to be done between the contractor and the engineer? Uh, that's going to be, my understanding is that's going to be done between the contractor okay. uh, and the engineer. You know, we have the so we're not holding anything up on the repair, uh, are we? I mean, we've already voted to repair it. Uh, not to my yeah. not to my knowledge. Right. So if I misspoke, I, I apologize. We're not holding anything up. We, okay. We're waiting for a dollar amount that we have to allocate in right. the contract. And it's going to be a lot cheaper than the first plan. The Which is why okay. Um, I would like to make one other comment. This board can disagree, but we're not disagreeable. That's Dan's favorite saying down there. Okay, we are getting along well. We have respect. And I want to thank my fellow board members for their participation and the congeniality we finally have on a board here. Thank you. If there's nothing else, meeting adjourned. Now, I will stay if anybody wants to talk about anything. Anybody else wants to stay? Come on up. Starry, starry night.